I hope, I'm, I'm just gonna pre-apologize in advance, I'm losing my voice, so hopefully I'll be. Yeah, I know, I know. She's the moderator, we're not looking for her to say much anyway. <laughs> so hopefully we'll be fine. Um, so welcome to the Art of Slow Travel panel. We're really excited to be chatting about this topic. Um, I think, I'm not really sure what the combined years of travel experience we have, but I think we've all at least done it for at least 10 plus years, I would say. Okay, so about like 50 plus years between the five of us. Um, so do you guys want to start off by introducing yourselves and where you traveled? Sure. <laughs> Uh, hi, I'm Jen McDermott. I'm the Head of Communications for Finder.com. I am Australian, if you can't hear my accent. Um, I have lived and travelled in Australia, the UK, Europe, Asia, um, and now I'm here in the US. I'm David Stein, uh, Money for the Rest of Us, and we've been travelling initially with our kids, started about 10 years ago. We spent a couple months in Maine and then did Asia and Europe, and, and now empty nester, so my wife, Lapel, and I just basically slow travel every winter into spring. <laughs> I live in Idaho, so basically <laughs> till May. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Craig Stevens. I run a blog called Retire Before Dad. I, uh, I'm from Alexandria, Virginia. I'm actually from Pittsburgh. I now live in Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, I took some, some years off uh, in my 20s where I traveled to Asia, Latin America, uh, mostly backpacking and um, you know, slow travel. I'm Doug Nordman. I write at the, the Military Guide, and I grew up in Pittsburgh also, but I left as fast as I could. Uh, we uh, focus on slow travel as military retirees, so typically it's uh, somewhere between two and three months with uh, no particular itinerary, uh, and the destinations change as the, as the military space aid flights change. If you're military and if you're looking at becoming a military retiree, we can talk later on, not here about military space aid travel, but uh, we're mostly gonna talk today about how we actually do the travel once we're in the place we land. Mm -hmm. um, I'm Sarah Lee Kane, so I'm the co-host of Beyond the Dollar. Um, I also write for quite a few other publications like um, TransferWise, Credit Karma, Lending Tree. Um, I've been traveling, I haven't been slow traveling, but I've been traveling since I was six years old. Um, so just every summer, we'd, I'd visit relatives months at a time. Um, I have slow traveled in Asia, so in particular um, China and South Korea. Lived in Australia for a year, slow traveled around there. <clears throat> Excuse me, I'm originally from Canada. We did, I did like a month long road trip and then um, here in the US. So this, I think I've lived in two states in the last two years and I may move to another one, I don't know yet. So. <laughs> All right, perfect. So let's start off with the first question. So what's the difference What's the difference between slow travel and other forms of travel, and why did you choose it? Let's start first. Um, so slow travel is really taking time to get to know a destination. So rather than, you know, I have two weeks, I'm going to see 10 countries in 14 days and just tick off those bucket list items, it's really getting to know a destination, it's people, it's culture. Um, that for me is appealing. I, as much as I'm Australian, I think I'm quite globally minded. So when I travel somewhere, whether it's a different city um, or whether it is a whole new country, I like to really understand um, different cultures and, and its people rather than just seeing a site, taking photos and, and leaving it onto the next. I, th I think the other advantage is, so I podcast and I don't like to batch my episodes. So if I slow travel, I can actually <laughs> work a couple days a week as we travel and just work it in and that way because it's exhausting getting ready for a vacation and because we did a few years ago going to Norway and I, I just about died and it's like so it's easy because I just don't, don't have that many good ideas anyway so one podcast a week is about <laughs> all I can do so that way you can integrate it into your travel as you work. Yeah, I would say slow travel is really um, travel without the constraints of time um, you know, most people take a week, at least in America, uh, people take a week, a week long vacation or maybe two weeks and you have an itinerary or maybe you're on a tour, you have, a, you know, a flight that you, you have to, you have to make or else you're going to miss work when you get home. So, uh, so you know, slow travel is when you really make that, that choice to, to just give yourself a lot of time and uh, see what happens without uh, an agenda. I focus on the financial difference in slower travel because you can stay in one place for a longer period of time. That means you can move away from the resort hotels and start renting Airbnbs for a monthly rate. You can rent a furnished apartment in a city at a monthly rate, even outside of Airbnb. 
you also have a chance to travel in off-peak seasons. You don't have to live like a two-week millionaire at the destination location. And finally, once you're in a town, uh, in a city, you can learn to use the public transportation system, whatever is there, and use your home base to make day trips. Uh, when you can do that for two or three months, then you can make as many day trips around the town as you want while using that home base, and it gives you a great experience just in that local area. Awesome. So um, it sounds like all of you guys have seen, seem to kind of make a career, or not a career, sorry, base your career around slow travel. Is that, is that true? Like you just kind of move from place to place? And not for me, no. Mm -hmm. um, I did most of my slow travel uh, where I quit my job, and I traveled for about two years. Uh, I haven't really interact. I haven't really uh, built it into my career at all, especially now that I have kids. So it's kind of more something I'm looking forward to when I retire. Uh, I did it in my 20s. I'll do it in my 50s and 60s. Cool. Awesome. I think I've subconsciously chosen careers that allow me to to take time when I do travel. Mm -hmm. um, I worked in the travel industry for eight years, and that was in Australia, where if you're traveling, you're taking two days just to get somewhere. So I don't want to take two days there and then come back and spend more time on the journey than actually experiencing a place. And now I work for a company which is pretty flexible with um, remote working. So if I'm going somewhere, I can take you know a week and actually really get to know the place. Cool. Um, I was an elementary school teacher for the last 10 years, and I specifically chose that career because I loved it. And it gave me an opportunity to travel. So this was an opportunity pre-digital nomad. So I knew that I could take that career path anywhere in the world with me, which is why, how I landed in all those countries. So if anybody ever wanted to be a teacher, that's a good reason to do it. <laughs> um, OK, so next question. How have you planned for slow travel? Or an, the, another way to say it is, how far in advance should someone plan for slow travel? I guess it depends on your circumstances. Um, for me, I've been able to, I've been quite impulsive with my slow travel. Um, you know, I moved countries within two weeks, so, um, and I left. so um, I, but I don't have dependents or, you know, I had the financial means at that time to do so. So I think it really depends. Um, and I think there's so many resources available to us today that if you do decide, you know what, next month I'm gonna take off, then, there's so much at your fingertips that you can plan quite quickly. In our case, we just decide to go, and, and typically we'll plan maybe two weeks ahead as we're traveling. I, I find planning any further out just exhausting, so I'd rather, and you might change your mind where you want to go. So th when we did do Europe, in, in sort of planning it out, our, our sons had booked some different concerts, one in Hamburg, one in Paris, and so that sort of directed kind of we had to be somewhere at a certain time. But generally, it, it's actually more fun just to have an open schedule and just kind of go where you want. But there needs to be some planning, so we plan out like a week or two. I'm a little different. When I've done it, um, I like to give myself a, a long period of time where I'm thinking about it and you know, try to plan the trip around maybe a, a break in your life, whether you finish grad school or your lease is up. Um, so it gives you a way to, to quit whatever you're doing and then plan for this long trip. And I would, I, when I did it, I, I would like to um, you know, book the flight and give myself you know, a, a long period of time where you, know, you, you show up in one place and end up in another place and how you get from one place to the other. Um, you, you don't really know how it's going to happen. But I always tell people, especially you know, friends who finish grad school or you know, they're moving to a different city and they have some time off, always plan for uh, more time and less money than you think. You know, I had a friend who had, you know, he just quit his career from 10 years, he's going to go travel, he says he's going to go three weeks to Asia. I was like, when you get there, you're going to want more than three weeks. You know, he had all the money he needed. Sure enough, you know, he came back three weeks later and he got a new job and that was his, that was his trip. So I, I told him, you know, take at least three months and, you know, he didn't listen and he regretted it when he got home. Well, first we check the uh, FinCon schedule and make sure we plan our travel <laughs> around that date. I, I swear PT did not pay me to say that. We, we do actually look at the FinCon date and base some of our travel around that, and we try to make sure we're back here a week or two before FinCon or planning our travel to leave right after FinCon. Uh, other parts of the year, we do travel a lot on space-available aircraft, and that means that we have the lowest priority for getting a chance to fly in a cargo aircraft with the military. And that means that you're going to do it at off-peak periods. You're going to avoid the summer when all the military active duty families are taking their kids somewhere. Uh, you're going to avoid Christmas when everybody's trying to get somewhere from college or family vacations. 
but the rest of the year, the springs and the falls, is a great time for travel, and it's also a great time to find discounts on wherever you're at. We tend to focus on warmer climates. Uh, I'm from Hawaii. I don't do cold weather anymore if I can help it. And if you're there in spring or in the fall, you're going to find a climate you enjoy. And once you establish a home base, once you can set those costs out for a month or two in advance by a long-term lease, for a traveler anyway, then you've got a good way to travel around at a very, essentially a very low daily cost. And we find now that we're older, in our 50s, that it's uh, enjoyable to us to have one major event during the day. Maybe uh, we're out of the house for six or seven hours a day and a meal, but we're not running around trying to check off everything in the 1,000 places to see before you die list. That would, frankly, that would kill us. So uh, we, we try to adapt a slower pace. Awesome. Just, I'm going to speak from my experience as a previous teacher. Um, one of the great things about international teaching is that I got 16 weeks of paid holiday. Um, so it was really difficult to leave that. <laughs> um, and I also got like free flights, and so that saved me tons of money. Um, but it was great because I knew at the beginning of the school year when I had these holidays, and so many of them were like three, four weeks at a time. And so then we were, like, this is when we were in Asia, we were able to then plan out like, okay, where are the airport hubs? What would be the best route? So we did, like, we, like my husband and I did plan it way far in advance just because we already knew exactly when we were gonna go and what were the best times of the year to do it. So you can be as, I think, I guess the takeaway is like depending on what your style is, what your planning style is and what you like, I'm pretty type A in terms of that. So I like to do pretty much like all of it in advance, so yeah. <laughs> All right, so this is a question I, I'm pretty sure we all get a lot. Like, when you get to the destination, how do you immerse yourself in the local culture? Um, uh, for me, I am a natural talker, so I <laughs> just go talk to people. Um, you'd be amazed at how language barriers can be lifted. Um, you know, I always try and learn a little bit, but um, yeah, I, I try and find a, a coffee shop I try near my base and I end up just chatting to the owners or people walking in and get tips, write things down, just try and connect with as many people as possible. I find that people who, who live in certain places become, they're, they're quite passionate about the places they live and they want, they want to show you and tell you the, the, best, the best place to get food or, or little secrets. So um, chatting to people is, is how I kind of get to know a place really well. We've used Airbnb a lot, and it's been helpful to get to know the, the local people and just basically go where the tourists aren't. So try to go the opposite direction and, and just get out into parts of towns where, where the locals are and go to a restaurant, just try, be willing to explore. And even if, if you, even if you don't speak the language, you just, you can point to, to what you want <laughs> and you get to know people better. <clears throat> Um, I've always liked overland travel as a way to uh, to really immerse yourself. You know, when you when you buy that round the world ticket that you hear people you know people say, oh, I'm going to quit my job again, a round the world ticket. You know, you're just you're just hopping from one airport to the other, and that's not really how you immerse yourself in a culture. Um, when I when I traveled to Asia, I flew into Beijing and I flew out of Singapore, and there's a pretty big distance between one and the other, and I gave myself about five months to do that, and. And we weren't taking tours through China and through Vietnam. You know, we were just taking the local the local transportation. So showing up at that you know, that train station, it's you know early in the morning, or you know that overnight train in China. Um, that's really you're really going to see what how people live when you're on that local transportation, as opposed to the the tour bus that's you know the double decker tour bus that you paid extra money for. This is going to sound like a stereotype, but it's who I am. Uh, whenever we're traveling somewhere, I look to see if there's a good surf break nearby, and I make the effort. You know, I might have to run a board, might have to run a wetsuit, might have to endure hypothermia to get out there and paddle out and enjoy a wave. But on the other hand, those are my people, and it doesn't matter what language you speak. Uh, even in my home break, uh, where a physician on fire has had the experience himself, uh, you'll hear four or five languages in there year-round uh, from people that have lived on Oahu for many years but still speak a different language other than English. Uh, when we're traveling, we'll also uh, settle in. And when you settle in, you can go to the, your favorite restaurant a couple times a week and the wait staff will get to know you. You can read the travel guides for that area and focus intensely on that 100 mile radius around where you're at. If you're in Europe, you're gonna do it with Rick Steves' guide. If you're in Asia, you're gonna find other references, other sources to figure out what's out there that you can look at every day. And as you walk around your local area, if you're staying in that apartment for a month, the people around there are going to start to recognize you and smile at you and 
you'll develop a conversation. The other advantage to uh, our skills on the internet is finding the bloggers in that area. <laughs> uh, when I went and spent a few months in Spain back in 2015, we were looking for information about living in Spain and came across a blog from a guy from Wisconsin who was living in Granada and he was going to live there for a year and then it was two years and then it was two and a half years <laughs> and I think after he came back to America I think he's back there now again he's spent quite a bit of time in Granada and so I reached out to him I said hey we're gonna be in Granada on these dates and it'd be great to get together at a, at a bar for a cup of coffee or for a meetup somewhere else you'd be surprised who you find traveling around the world with you when you start looking for that area on the internet that sounds great. Um, I know this would be diff probably a difficult question to answer, but if, can you think of like one of the most memorable moments or encounters you've had in all of your experiences of, or years of travel? Uh, most memorable. Um, this is a family-friendly audience, right? <laughs> or, yeah. <laughs> I like, yes. <laughs> I can uh, start if you guys want to think yeah. about it. Okay, so um, two things, actually. I met my husband, and we got married in Hong Kong. So that was pretty cool. And then I gave birth in China, and that was a very interesting story. Uh, <laughs> I won't go into details, but yeah, that was definitely um, definitely a, like a test to like figure out how to speak Chinese when you're in labor. That was, that was interesting, yeah. <laughs> so that was probably the most memorable, yes. <laughs> um, I think uh, for me, I, I spent a lot of time in Istanbul, um, in Turkey. And I don't know if anybody has experienced a Haman, but um, I became quite um, a regular at one of the local Hamans. They're amazing Turkish bars. They scrub you raw. They, they wash your hair, these, these ladies. Um, so I think for me, just no language skills um, with these women who were working at the Haman. I didn't know what to expect. They push you around. Um, <laughs> but I, I hated it. I absolutely hated it the first time. And then I was back there the next week and was there pretty much every week for the next few months. <laughs> I think ours is, is Japan. My son and I went to Japan together for the first time, I think, in 2010. And he didn't speak any Japanese. Now he actually speaks Japanese and lives there. But the, on that first trip, you know, we'd read all the guidebooks. And, and one of the things that I remember reading that if you want the, because we didn't speak any Japanese, if we wanted them to bring the, the, the ticket for your meal, that you, you would make this, and I don't even think they do, they make this sign to get them. And so we're like trying to sign the person <laughs> to bring us the check. And, and they're, they're looking at us across the room, like, what, what's he doing? <laughs> So finally, they came over, and the check was on the side of the table, just sitting there waiting for us to bring it up. So I mean, you just when you travel, you're going to make mistakes, and you're going to look silly, and that's probably the silliest we've looked. <laughs> but we're, we're going back to Japan over the holidays, and, and we'd love to travel there. Cool. I felt most immersed in the culture, uh, like I said, you know, through some of these, uh, some of the land travel, particularly going through Central America. I took all uh, what they call chicken buses. It's uh, it's really like a, an Amer a used American school bus that they you know paint or you know refurbish to carry passengers through Central America. And if you look at the map, Central America is really small. But when you get on that on that chicken bus, uh, you know to get from one place to the other might take eight hours. And you know on the map it just looks like a you know a really small trip. Uh, so those uh, you know, solo, I was by myself traveling on these chicken buses in you know Guatemala. Nicaragua, um, in parts not, not in the tourist areas. That's where I think I really felt uh, most immersed. We spent uh, a total of five months in Spain in 2015 in two separate trips. And during one of those trips, I finally had the chance to catch the waves at El Palmar. It's a uh, version of, Spanish version of Santa Cruz, nice hippie town. And I really enjoyed surfing out there. Another memorable experience was going to Bangkok. Uh, my wife uh, is a retired Navy reservist, and she had many occasions to travel to Bangkok for Navy exercises back in the early 2000s. We've kept that up since she's retired. We still go back every three or four years. And while we're there, it's going to sound a little weird, but this is who we are. We uh, go to Bum Run Grad Hospital for concierge physicals. And it's a very different experience than being in America in a physical exam. It's what you would call concierge medicine. And it's very thorough, and it's very inexpensive, and it's a very actually pleasant experience to be able to talk with a medical professional who can do a thorough exam, review the results with you right there. They actually apologize if you have to wait more than half an hour in their lounge with beverages and snacks. 
and they will go into the details and dig in for anything you want to do further research on. And they're world renowned for doing this. And again, it's completely different than the American medical system. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Hey, okay. well, obviously we're at FinCon, so do you feel like you saved money <laughs> uh, for solar travel, and why? I, I've spent a lot of money. I probably have bought, could have bought houses many, many times over with the amount I've spent on travel, but that's something that I personally value. Um, however, I know Doug mentioned earlier that it can be quite affordable. Um, you know, I stay in I stay in Airbnbs usually. I stay on people's couches. Um, I have connected with people. Um, friends of friends that I've met through travel have connected me to other people, so I've saved a lot of money that way. Um, I think time is the ultimate luxury, so, um, you know, when I'm not spending money on hotels, but it's sort of a bit more drawn out, then it kind of balances out anyway. I think one way we saved money when we did Europe with our three kids, we thought we'd get these train passes and be able to travel all over. It actually turned out to be cheaper. You could lease a car in Europe, and so you actually take ownership of the car because there's somehow there's a quirk in European tax law that nearly new cars are have a lower VAT, a value-added tax, and so there's actually rental car agency, I think one was Eurodrive, where you take ownership of a brand new car and we kept it for two months and then returned it. We picked it up in, in Rome, dropped it off in London. And it was cheaper than renting, like your typical renting a car it was way cheaper than the train. So that, that's one way we've saved money. Now, I started my blog in, in 2013. It originally had a, more of a, a travel flair to it. And uh, one of the biggest posts I wrote, one of my, the first posts that actually got any traction was called 14 months, 18 countries, $10,000. Uh, and it was, it went through the details of, and it's still out there, uh, it went through the details of all the money I spent and you know how my, my per diem and some uh, some little piece of paper that I wrote down some notes on, and um, you know when I factored in the the plane rides and I think even health insurance and everything, um, that's that's how much I spent was ten thousand dollars for for fourteen months of travel and I was in Asia and South America Central America, I got I had a, I think I had like a, a frequent flyer at the time this was two thousand one so frequent flyers were pretty easy to come by in December of two thousand one. There are a lot of flights available. And uh, I was also in Argentina during the financial crisis of that period in 2002. So suddenly the, the dollar, I think, quadrupled in value in Argentina. So I recommend if you're looking for a place to travel, look for the economic crises around the, around the world. Uh, Argentina, I think, has gone through it again recently. So it's a great time to visit there. Some of the economic crisis and just short of war zone. Right. Yeah, no. <laughs> I'm not, I'm not very good at that myself. <laughs> but compared to your typical American vacation, one or two weeks during the summer when millions of other Americans are trying to get in their vacation time during the summer, yes, you do save money on slow travel. And you save even more by the off-peak seasons, by being able to plan way out in advance and look for the bargains. Uh, for those of you who are empty nesters, uh, you have a motivation to launch your kids from the nest because wherever they settle might be a pretty good place to visit. Uh, my daughter is active duty Navy, and she spent uh, one of her tours in Rhoda, spent another tour in Charleston, South Carolina, and now she spent a tour in Norfolk. And so we've been stalking her all over the globe, enjoying many of these Navy home ports the way we wish, we wish we'd been able to enjoy them 30 years ago. So you can save a lot of money by finding ways to lodge with friends or family if, you, if that's convenient for you and if you don't mind spending time with your family in those areas. But again, you're going to prioritize what you want to do with your time in your life. And the time you spend on travel, the money you spend on travel, you're probably going to treasure those memories and you're not going to fret 20 years later about how much money you spent to get there or how much it cost to enjoy the experience you had. Awesome. So talking back about my te teaching career, I also got free housing. So free flights, free housing, 16 weeks off, which is amazing. So I saved basically, I saved money that way. and so. All, like I would say like 90% of my salary was disposable income and so I, and it was great we I live near an airport hub um, there's a lot of great discount airlines in Asia now so you can sometimes you can fly for as little like as like 10 bucks to from Hong Kong to Singapore like it's great so um, a really great way to save money is if you do go to Asia I mean your most expensive flight would be from North America to Asia but after that if you figure out where the hubs are um, Singapore's a really great one. So if you figure out where the hubs are and just base yourself around that, 
hub, and then if you want to go to little trips, if you want, then that's a really great way to do it. Um, you know, whenever they have sales, again, luxury of time, um, you know, you can wait till those sales happen. Um, you know, and usually they're off peak, right? So um, that's a really great way to save money as well. I think that's our last question. Okay. So I'm sure everybody here is wondering is, can anyone make slow travel work even if they have responsibilities or like a nine to five or kids? Um, I mean, I believe that anybody can, can design their life the way they, the way they want to. I've met a lot of people with families who, who travel. There's a great blog called Why Travel Blog, um, an Australian couple who have, I think, three kids um, and they have responsibilities and they, they make it work. Um, I have a nine to five job. Um, nine to five would be nice, actually. It's a lot longer than that. But I, I make that work. Um, you know, I, I've been very open with my employer and it's a very uh, flexible kind of situation. So I think, again, I've kind of gravitated towards careers and jobs that will allow me to take time when I want to or work remotely um, if I want to. I think with, you know, our, with our three children, our view is we didn't want their formal schooling to get in the way of their education. And so we've always been willing to travel with them. They, they've homeschooled, they've done private school, they've done public school. I think the one thing in their case, and I didn't realize this growing up, is you actually don't need a high school diploma to go to college. So all of our kids quit high school when they were 16 or so. And that allowed some time for us to travel even more. And then they started college. They started college early. But you don't, you don't need a GED. It, it depends on the college. You just start. I mean, you take the ACT or something like that. And so, I think it's harder if you want your kids to have every sort of former public school experience, the prom, etc. But if you're flexible, there's enough other education opportunities you can do it while you travel. Yeah, I'm, I'm in a different boat. I did uh, my traveling. I got, kind of got it out of my system before I met my wife and we had kids. I, I currently have a nine to five job and I have three kids, ages three, five, and six. And we are not going to be slow traveling anytime soon. Uh, it would take a pretty major commitment uh, to, to be able to do that. And people are doing it and blogging about it, but we live in the suburbs. We go to public school. Kids play soccer. You know, they have, I think, six weeks in the summer. So if we would want to try anything, you know, we would do that six weeks in the summer. And uh, you know, that, then they would miss swim team and, and you know, summer at home. So we're we're kind of in the boat where we're gonna have a, a traditional sort of suburban lifestyle at least what, until the kids get a little older, and then maybe start experimenting with uh, you know some longer trips in the summer when they get older. And then certainly when the kids are empty nesters, I think that's more our plan to uh, to travel then. But you do see blogs out there of people who are doing it, and he's done it. It's just it's a much much bigger commitment than it was you know than it is when you're single and no kids. Many of you know uh, Jeremy from uh, Go Curry Cracker. I've known Jeremy and Winnie for about a decade, and uh, they're two-year-old. I guess he's probably pushing three years old now. I think he's on his second passport because they just don't have enough pages in the usual passports. And you'll figure out what kind of kid you've got. If travel's a priority for you parents, then your kid will probably learn how to travel with you, even if you have two or three or four kids. It can be a challenge, and you may elect to settle in one area for a while. Another friend of mine, that guy uh, Jed in Granada in Spain, uh, got there on a two-year visa, enrolled his kids in a local elementary school, and it took them a little while to catch up on their Spanish skills, but they were doing fine. When it was time to leave Spain, when his visa finally ran out, the kids really weren't that excited about going back to America because all their friends were in Granada. So it depends on how long you settle in one place and what kind of travelers you got for your kids. Uh, again, if you're an empty nester, it's uh, great to just get out and go and not have to worry about what your kids are doing or where they are. And it's nice if your travel schedules overlap. We've actually traveled with our adult daughter, and I find her a lot more fun to travel with as an adult <laughs> than I did when she was younger. So when you're planning slow travel, like before you do that big time commitment, would you, like, would you recommend like kind of a test run? Like how, how would you, have you, have you guys ever done that? Or you just kind of went all in? I'm all in. Okay. <laughs> I'm all in. <laughs> No, we tested it. Our, this trip to Maine, I was been telecommuting for years, and it finally occurred to me that I didn't have to stay in Idaho if I was telecommuting. So we we took our van, minivan, drove to Maine, and just tried it out. What it would be like to live, you know, apart from Idaho for a month or two, and it was a good test. And it turns out that you know we liked slow travels. So we kind of got the bug from there. 
Yeah, we're, we're currently experimenting with mm -hmm. longer road trips and trips to California mm -hmm. to see grandma and grandpa. Mm -hmm. So uh, hopefully you know, the kids will become more, more used to it. But um, I think we'd be more likely to, tr to travel overseas with uh, like a longer term commitment, like moving to a city, mm -hmm. more of an expat life than a, than a slow travel life with the kids so that they could get immersed in the school and, and continue their education. And I remember a few years ago, Justin McCurry from the blog Root of Good, uh, they tried to travel up in uh, the northeast coast up into Canada, and they had their three kids, including their two-year-old. Uh, and I, if I remember right, about six weeks into it, they declared defeat and surrendered and came back home. <laughs> and, and now that child is older, you know, five or six years old and much better traveler, and they went out and they were running around for nine weeks last summer. So as your kids start out, you have to ramp up to it, and you may require a lot of planning for the younger kids, but as they get older, that's the lifestyle they know. Cool. Just one other comment on We have a dog which can kind of hinder slow travel, but you know, our solution is basically we have joint custody now, so my sister-in-law <laughs> likes our dog. In fact, I think she loves our dog more than we do, so when we travel <laughs> for half the year, she takes over the dog, and the, do and the dog's perfectly happy with her. Likes her house, gets fed, because she gets more fast food with, with her. <laughs> so. Awesome, I think that's it. Okay, that's it for, thank you guys. Um, if, you guys, if you have any questions, we are more than happy to answer them. Sure. So, like, what's your like next big place that you want to go? So, what's your, your next place? big destination? Um, well, I've been in America for two years, and I haven't even scratched the surface. So, my plan is to try and um, slow travel around around this country as much as possible. Um, I don't know how long I'll be here for at the moment. I have no intention of going home or somewhere next, so I really want to explore within the country. Well, we'll be in Mexico over Thanksgiving, but the, our big winter trip will be in Japan over the holidays, and then our son's in Seattle, so we're going to slow travel drive probably the west coast down into Arizona from January through May. Our next big trip is to a place where none of us have been and maybe our most challenging uh, is a Disney cruise. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> We've never cruised and we're going to be driving to Port Canaveral from D.C., so we'll see how that goes. This is, this is not frugal. This is not travel this hackable. Not frugal. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't say it was a cheap travel. We're actually wrapping up two months. This is day 52, and uh, I flew 5,000 miles after living in Hawaii for 30 years. I flew 5,000 miles to enjoy a hurricane evacuation from Hurricane Florence out of Norfolk. So that was my big experience of this trip. Uh, we're going to go back to Oahu uh, next week after FinCon is over, and then we're just going to catch up in uh, yard work and the mail and all the other blog posts that I've written while we've been gone. We're not sure where we're going next. We're going to either go to Australia or Bangkok. It's probably going to be one of those two. And Australia in 2019, I've got to look at the surf forecast and the water temperatures. <laughs> and then uh, Bangkok, we've been there several times. We like going in November and December. And the whole point is that we're getting older, and you should not tra save travel for old age. But I have an avatar in my mind whenever I do travel of a guy I met at a military uh, Space A passenger terminal. He walked in there and he was dragging his bag in one hand and he was hobbling on his cane with the other hand because one of his hips really was about ready for its third hip replacement. He's 85 years old and he had been flying space available as a military retiree on cargo jets than, for longer than I've been alive. And his attitude was, I'm here in Norfolk, we're going to catch a flight to Europe. I said, well, where are you going to go? He said, Europe. And I said, well, what are you going to do? He said, hang out. I said, how long are you going to be there? He said, ah, kids want us there for Thanksgiving. That's three months. And that's about a 90-day visa for him. So he had figured out at the age of 85 that he was still ready to travel. And that's my goal now. Awesome. Uh, oh, yep. Go ahead. Oh, OK. Um, oh, gosh. Uh, so this was kind of by accident. So we originally moved to North Carolina, and then now we're in Florida. So we may move to another state. So I, I think I'm just going to be state hopping. I'm not really sure. But uh, my husband and I have talked have been talking about Europe. So he's also an international school, school teacher. And so we're basing our slow travel off of where he can get a job um, overseas. So Berlin is on our hit list. So um, and it's unfortunately a little bit difficult to get a teaching job there. So we're just, we've been applying for the last two years. And so as soon as we get something, we're just gonna go. <laughs> yeah. Okay, any other questions? Yeah. Mm. 
apps or any particular are there any websites, any authors that are Good question. That's a really good. So I can speak from um, like for Asia. So China is going to be more expensive. Like U.S. is probably like it's funny they have um, the price list. So if you go to D.C. to get your visa, like U.S. is the most expensive one. Okay, whatever reason you can kind of come up with your conclusion. So um, I would say the like depending on what country you're most likely going to unfortunately pay more as an American. I'm just going to like throw it out there. Um, the Ferrang tax. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, but most places like, so, so some places like Mongolia, you don't need a visa, but every other country except for the U.S. needs it. So it's one of those like how, the question is like how much do you want to go to that country? And if the visa situation sucks, like how much are you willing to do it? You can hire people to do it for you. There are services like that. So, um, and they can range really, like, really wildly. Like, I, like, so my husband and I also want to go to Russia, and so for him it's like slightly more difficult than for me because I still have a Canadian passport. So the, I think it's like, it was like, I think it's 400 bucks just per person to get all of our visas for Russia because we want to do the Trans-Siberian Railroad as well. So it's like, it's kind of like the cost-benefit ratio. Like, do you want to do it that badly to pay for that? If you think you know the rules, they're always changing. Mm -hmm. So give yourself at least six months if you're looking at a visa situation. My first advice would be to figure out who you are. If you can go to Europe for 90 days on a Schengen visa, do that, see how you feel about it. If it feels like you need to do it for two years, then leave because your 90 days is up and sort out the visa situation in your hometown. You might have to drive quite a distance to a consulate or an embassy in order to get the proper documentation in America. You might have to arrange everything in America before you leave America. And then once you get to the country of your choice, you might have to do more work in their capital or some major city to clear up your visa paperwork. And it's going to be in a foreign language. You're, unless you're fluent in that language, you're probably going to hire an agency to do it for you. Uh, another experience with us has been Bangkok. Uh, the rules continue to change. Sometimes you're, you were able to go there 29 days. That's the current rules, 29 days. Before, you could easily extend that. And now it's required to do more work with a consulate or an embassy in America before you go back to uh, Bangkok. So do your research, read everything you can on the internet, and you'll find travel bloggers uh, who have gone through the experience probably within less than a year uh, when you get to that blog post. They've probably got the latest rules and they'll tell you all the information and they're worth contacting to have them tell you all the stuff that might not have made it to that blog post. There are also a lot of hacks around extending, I've found. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I can't, come, I can't come from a place of being American, but um, coming into America, it was 90 days until I had a, a work permit and a lot of, we call them visa runs. Um, we know different areas that are quite cheap to leave the country for a certain amount of time and then come back in on a, on a new, brand new visa. And I know there's different places around the world where I've had to do that as well. Yeah, Asia will, their rules change all the time. Like, so funny, I don't know if it's a funny story. It's but, funny, yeah. Uh, <laughs> so in China, um, they have very specific background colors for your visa photos. So for the longest time, it's red. But what they ended up doing is like every other day, it was either red or white or blue. And so you ended up having to go and pay the consulate extra money to get the photo, whatever color of the day it was. So it was like a way for them, like my theory was like it was a way for them to make extra money because like why, like does it really matter what background color, but so there's stuff like that and you just kind of roll with the punches. Like, it, you know, again, most of my experience is in Asia. So like a lot of that just happens there. Um, you just got to laugh it off. Like if you're paying an extra five bucks for photo, you're paying an extra five bucks for photo. Like you just got to do it. <clears throat> Any other questions yet? Yeah. Okay, that's a good question. Um, so again, I'll speak from Asia. It's so cheap there. It's like to, so concierge services is like, um, so what you would pay for, con so if you go to like a local hospital in China, you're paying $2 to see a doctor. And then um, if you're getting like medicine, I think the most I paid was $10 and it was like, it was a shopping bag full of medicine, like it was a lot. Um, but concierge services are more expensive. They probably will have people that do speak English or other local languages and you're, I think in China, the most expensive I paid for concierge was like $20 to see the doctor. So you can do travel insurance. Um, I, ha I haven't done that because I've been, I've had it provided for my employer for so many years. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, 
Yeah, I've had a few experiences. You know, a lot of countries have uh, pharmacies that you can just walk right into and get what you need. Uh, so those are all, especially in Asia, you know, if you need something, you point to whatever. So they don't, they don't speak English, you point to whatever's the problem, and they'll give you the medicine. Uh, but I, I was in Chiang Mai in, in Thailand, and I, I was showing signs of malaria. I just came out of a malaria area, and I was feeling really rotten. So I, I said, well, I better go get this checked out. I started walking down the street. There happened to be a malaria clinic. As I walked down the street, I went in there. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> she pricked my finger. 20 minutes later, she said, no malaria, and there was no cost. And uh, so... <laughs> It was, it was just kind of a fun experience and walked home and started feeling better. Yeah, um, I think it's a really good question. I think it's really important to understand that um, a night in hospital, I spent a night in hospital um, internationally. It was, it was actually in Turkey and it wasn't that expensive, but there are some places where it is astronomical just to go in and, you know, if you kept overnight for dehydration. Um, we actually did some analysis at Finder on um, hospital beds versus hotel stays. And there are places where it's like 400% more than staying at a luxurious five-star hotel just to stay in hospital overnight. So for me, I think travel insurance has always been part of my budget. It's a must. Check your own health insurance. You might find out that you're covered on, to a limited extent for international travel and then supplement that with a high deductible policy. You probably, if you do end up needing uh, some kind of hospitalization overseas, will probably be all right with uh, having the insurance kick in after your high deductible is paid. But many times, especially Latin America and Asia, you'll pay out of pocket and that's, it's not even worth filing a claim. Yeah. If you want to give birth in another country. <laughs> try, try to avoid that. I already. don't yeah. recommend having someone, or I don't recommend uh, not speaking the language. Um, I did, we did end up finding a translator. So this was a, out of, we called it a VIP service, but anyway, so I, ended up, I did end up getting a translator. But the, uh, the OBGYN and the nurses, none of them spoke English. So that was, yeah, that was interesting. <laughs> so if you have anything like a major, um, not a major, sorry, chronic condition or pregnancy, things like that, then you, you probably do want to like, make sure that there are hospitals that have doctors or translators that do speak English or you know, whatever language you feel most comfortable in so that when emergencies do arise that you know where to go. Okay. Oh, for me. Okay. So Asia is really cheap. <laughs> um, I think I sp so I spent a month in Thailand, and I probably my husband and I both spent about six hundred dollars for everything. And so, but, and we didn't we didn't eat in the best places. We did stay in some nice hotels, but six hundred dollars. I don't know if you can do that now. This was like seven years ago. So um, I think Thailand's got. I mean, you can still buy like a dollar a meal off the street, but in terms of like Airbnbs are a bit more expensive than they were seven years ago. Yeah, uh, it really depends where you are. And when, when you're slow traveling, you tend to go to the cheaper places. I was going through Central America, and, and I kind of rushed my way through Panama and, and Costa Rica. And when I got to Nicaragua, it was half price. So I, when I was traveling in Asia, I think I budgeted about $20 a day. And I could, some days I got by on 10 It depends on you know, booking tours and if you're traveling on a, you know, if you're, um, you know, transportation or whatever you're doing. But uh, you can, I think it's still possible to travel in Asia for $20 a day oh, yeah. uh, pretty easily with cheap hotels and, mm -hmm. and local restaurants. Yeah. I know this past winter we, we were looking at should we get an RV or should we stay at Airbnbs and hotels? And, and we ended up, we decided that it was cheaper to stay at Airbnbs and hotels than the depreciation on an, an RV. And so we ended up spending about $95 a night just just for lodging either through an Airbnb or a hotel and it, it worked. It was, that was over three months, much cheaper than you know, the depreciation hit on an RV. If you're traveling off peak and if you're staying for long times instead of short resort stays, your, your alternate question there is how much would it cost otherwise or what's the alternative price? And you're probably traveling about as cheap as you can. If you compound that by travel hacking or by having somebody uh, rent your house, rent from you, while you're traveling abroad, then uh, you can actually start getting into traveling for free or even making money. Uh, and so there's no set number. It all depends on where you're going, how long you're staying there, and what time of year. Yeah. I think one more, we have time for one more question. Yeah. Yes? I concur. Yeah. <laughs> Have any kind of advice on traveling 
Yeah, my son's flown since he was six months old. Um, the, I, will, I will argue the younger they are, the easier it is, and then when they reach a certain age, then it becomes a little more challenging. But, you know, my son's been flying, like, from Asia and back for months. He's been on, like, 14-hour road trips with us, and so, like, if we just put him in the car seat and he knows we're driving a long time, he just entertains himself. So it's one of those things where it's, like, it's more, I guess, where I'm coming from, it's, like, it's more the parent, like, what's your tolerance level? Like, if you're, all your kids are having a meltdown, like, are you going to be able to deal with that in a car or on a plane? Um, which is probably why it's really important to test it out, because we... I see some of you yeah. heard this story before. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so what's your tolerance level? Um, I was very anti-iPads when I was, before I became a mother, and now I'm kind of like, okay, sometimes it's necessary, so that's where I'm at with that. Um, I don't know, maybe you guys... Just go. I mean, you get the kids get used to travel, and, and one of the things when I was still, you know, as an investment manager, I would take my kids once a year on a trip just with me. And so I think spending time one on one with your kids traveling is a great way for them to get used to travel. And then it contrasts when everybody's together. But you just you know your kids better. You, you love your kids more than anybody else's kids. You can deal with them better, and you just you just take them. And you, don't, you just don't let school get in the way either. I mean, there's ways. I mean, if, if you want swim team, you want soccer, you want all the events, it's much harder. But if your kids are like ours and they, don't really, they didn't really like sports anyway, <laughs> you just took them. Yeah, I, I think it does depend some on the kid, too. My, I always thought my son would be really tolerant of travel and, and swimming, just swim in the water and learn. But he's just he's a really sensitive kid. And he's the oldest of three. And we were going to California. and. Uh, yeah, we, we had an early morning flight out of Dulles, and I took him to go get some breakfast, and he had a total meltdown at the Aubon Pond because he thought the plane was going to leave without us. And he's just like, he's worried about timelines, and just certain kids are, are different. And, and uh, I like to think that you could just yeah. get your kid on that plane at six, but, at six months old, but my kid, uh, he was six months old on a plane, and he was miserable. I mean, um, so it does depend on the kid, and I, I, I wish it was as easy as just like getting them to do it a lot, but uh, it's not always so easy. Have a plan B to retreat back to wherever you're staying and be able to yes. cook a meal or two there and get a good <laughs> night's sleep. Yeah. All right, well, um, that's all the time we have, so thank you, everyone. Um, if you're military and you have more questions about military space A, I'll be out in a quarter here outside the room.